Chairman, shall we start or shall we give two more minutes? Let's give two more minutes because I can see a lot of people joining in. Yeah. And uh, we'll start in two minutes. Okay. Thank you. I think we can uh, start the proceedings now. Okay, let's start the proceedings. So, very good uh, evening to all our participants from Sri Lanka, and a very good morning, afternoon, or evening to those of who uh, are joining us from other jurisdictions. I can see some participants who are joining from other jurisdictions as well. My name is Asanga Gunawansa. I'm the chairman of the Overseas Relations Committee of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. And we have organized this event together with my colleague and good friend, Mr. Amrudha Perra, who is the co-chair, uh, convener of the Overseas Relations Committee, Mr. Mr. Manjuka Fernando Pulle, and several other committee members and assistants who have helped us. This is uh, the very first event that we are organizing for this year, 2023. And uh, we are planning a series of events that will follow. And in this event, we will be dealing with the issue of uh, uh, demystifying sovereign debt restructuring. And as all of you know, Sri Lanka uh, is going through a severe financial crisis at the moment. Perhaps uh, the worst crisis this small, beautiful island has faced since independence. It is easy for us to sit down and analyze what went wrong, but that said, it's also important to find solutions. So with that in mind, we have put together a panel of uh, four experts who will be interviewed today by our convener, Mr. Manjit Fernando Pulle, attorney at law. And I'm sure that uh, all the participants, myself included, will learn a lot from this webinar. And that said, before I introduce the four speakers, May I have the pleasure of uh, inviting, first introducing and then inviting uh, my good friend of over 30 years now, Mr. Salia Pieris, President's Council, the current president of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. Mr. Pieris holds a master's degree in international business law from the University of London and a bachelor's degree in law from the Open University of Sri Lanka. He qualified as an attorney at law after completing his uh, studies in law in Sri Lanka Law College, and during which uh, time he was also the president of the Law Students Association. Mr. Pires is an Eisenhower Fellow and also an alumnus of the Dealing with the Past or DWP program of uh, Switzerland and IVLP of USA. Mr. Pires is uh, heading a cha chamber that specializes in the area of criminal law, public law, and fundamental rights. And he practices mainly in the appellate courts of Sri Lanka. He commenced his career as a public prosecutor or as or state counsel, as we call in Sri Lanka, attached to the Attorney General's department. After leaving the Attorney General's department and starting his private practice, uh, for some time he was the chairman of the Office of the Missing Persons and also a member of the 
uh, Sri Lanka Reconciliation Mechanism and the, and the Human Rights Commission. Salia, over to you. I have the pleasure and honor in inviting you to say a few words to kickstart these proceedings. Thank you. So on behalf of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, let me first of all thank our distinguished panelists for having accepted our invitation to uh, participate in this webinar and to uh, share their expertise on debt restructuring. So as Sri, uh, I must thank also the Overseas Relations Committee of the Bar Association, Dr. Asan Gunavan, its chairman, Mr. Andrew the Pere Rights co-chair, and Mr. Manjuka Fernando Pule, uh, the convener, and all the members of the Overseas Relations Committee for the work they have uh, for putting this webinar together. So as Sri Lanka awaits, or as Sri Lankans eagerly await the debt restructuring, and of course, consequently uh, awaiting the relief which would be forthcoming from the uh, International Monetary Fund, I think it is important for us Sri Lankans and also for the, all those who are friends of Sri Lanka to understand that Sri Lanka's crisis is not only a crisis, not only a pure economic crisis, but a crisis of governance. And I think in the long term, it is essential that while we talk of debt restructuring and relief from the IMF, that we do not lose sight of the need for fundamental reforms in our institutions and strengthening the institutions, strengthening the rule of law and governance is essential. During the last uh, year or two, the Bar Association has uh, played uh, an important role in attempting to strengthen the rule of law in Sri Lanka. In January 2022, the Bar Association was the first of the professional associations to highlight within Sri Lanka uh, the, the impact of the impending economic crisis. And I think it is uh, important also that thereafter that the Bar Association participated or, uh, and attempted to present certain proposals relating to uh, resolving the governance crisis which is prevailing. So those are some things which I want to share. Once again, thank you to our distinguished panel and thank you to our overseas relations committee. And we eagerly await uh, your insights into demystifying the sovereign debt restructuring. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Salia. And now we can start our main proceedings for the day. Uh, let me have the pleasure of uh, introducing the four panelists that we have invited. Uh, first, let me introduce Dr. Riza Bakir. Dr. Bakir is a managing director with uh, Alvarez and Marshall and Global Practice, a leader of Alvarez and Marshall Sovereign Advisory Services. He is also a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School uh, Center for Business and Government. Prior to joining this firm, he was the governor of the Pakistan Central Bank and the, the State Bank of Pakistan. Uh, prior to that, he has spent approximately 19 years with the International Monetary, International Monetary Fund and two years with the World Bank, during which time he had headed IMF's uh, Debt Policy Division which oversees IMF's work on sovereign debt related to policies, including sovereign, sovereign debt restructuring. And he had worked on debt restructuring in several countries, including Greece, Jamaica, and Ukraine. Dr. Baki earned his bachelor's degree in economics from Harvard University, and he was a PhD from University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Baki, I welcome you to uh, these proceedings. Thank you very much for finding the time to join us. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Sergi uh, Lenau, uh, Deputy Chief Economist of the Economic Research Department of the International Institute of Finance since 2018. Prior to that, Mr. Lenau was an economist at the IMF, where he was involved in the design and implementation of IMS program in Greece and Latvia. Prior to joining the IMF, uh, he was an economist in the International Financial Division at the Bank of England. He holds a PhD in economics from the Unistat Pompo Febra, in 2000, uh, which he obtained in 2008. Then we have Mr. Ian Clark. Ian is a partner of the global law firm White and & Case and the head of his sovereign and public sector practice. 
He is heading the White and Case team, advising the bondholder committee consisting of more than 30 asset managers holding Sri Lanka's international bonds. Yet he is also currently advising the government of Zambia, Suriname, and other in, in, uh, in connection with sovereign debt restructuring. So, Ian and Sergi, it's our pleasure to have you both as panelists for today's webinar. Then we have Mr. Sean Hagen. Sean was the general counsel for International Monetary Fund for 14 years, from 2004 to 2018. In this capacity, he has advised the IMF's management, executive board, and membership on all legal aspects of IMF's, IMF's operations, including regulations, advisory, and lending functions. He is currently the senior advisor to Russia's and company, the finance advisors to the bondholders committee in Sri Lanka's sovereign debt restructuring. Sean is also a professor attached to the Georgetown University. Um, and during the years 2018 and 2019 academic year, he had also been a visiting fellow at the Oxford uh, University, Exeter College. He received the Juris Doctor from Georgetown University Law Center and also received a Master of Science in International Political Economy from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Sean, it's our pleasure to have you as a panelist today. And that said, I will now invite our convener, Mr. Manju Fernandopoli, attorney at law, to take the proceedings forward uh, for the today's webinar. Manjuka, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Gunwansa. It's a pleasure to invite Ian Reza and uh, Sergey uh, to this uh, to this uh, to this panel webinar. Uh, the, just to set set out what, what uh, the order of the day, we each speaker will will uh, will give a presentation on the first in the first round uh, on the DSA. There'll be two rounds, and the second round would be uh, would on Ian and Ian and uh, Ian and Sean would speak. And thereafter, at end of Ian's presentation, there will be Q&A. Uh, we, we will try to accommodate many questions as possible, but it will be probably half an hour, but there may be time constraints. So I think it's a, it's a pleasure that I, invi I invi invite, uh, a, 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 um, uh, invite and welcome all of you for this uh, webinar. So to start the proceedings, I, will invi I want to invite Reza to give his presentation. Reza will speak about the, 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 the IMF DSA and how DS, debt sustainability is important for the IMF funding lending decisions. And he, his that would be his uh, presentation. And I invite uh, Reza to start his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Manjuka, for the invitation. It's a real pleasure, a real honor to be with everybody on this event. Um, uh, my greetings to the people of Sri Lanka as well, uh, who are going through a understandably difficult period uh, of the debt crisis that Sri Lanka faces. For most of my talk, I will not be uh, sharing the screen. There is a background deck and uh, happy for that to be provided to anybody who wants more detail about the points um, that I will be making today. Uh, but just at the very beginning, I wanted to maybe uh, share a little bit about how I am going to organize uh, my remarks. Um, just before I do that, as uh, Mr. Perez already mentioned, I am a managing director and global practice leader of sovereign advisory services at Alvarez and Marcel, uh, and also a senior fellow at the Kennedy School where I'm doing research related to international mechanisms for sovereign debt restructuring. Now, Manjuka had uh, requested that I speak about the role of the debt sustainability assessment that the IMF does. And uh, to do that, I am going to organize my remarks around three key areas. The first is why and how is an assessment of debt sustainability relevant for the fund's lending decision? And I think it's important to take a step back and to ask this question because it helps frame everything that um, one then subsequently thinks about. The second point that I want to cover is uh, what role does the debt sustainability assessment play in the restructuring process and particularly in the interactions between the debtor and the creditors. And finally, uh, I will talk about a few of the specific points related to the content of the Debt sustainability assessment. These will be a bit more technical, but before one gets to some of the technical points about the content, uh, 
I think it's important to, to understand why uh, the DSA is relevant and what role does it play. So let me then begin by sharing a few points about why um, and how is an assessment of debt sustainability relevant for the funds uh, lending decision. And um, I should begin by noting that um, the IMF produces a debt sustainability assessment for all of its member countries as part of its surveillance work as well. But in the context of lending, this acquires a special significance. I should also say that um, it is not necessary that there is this dependency in the IMF DSA for all debt restructurings. To the extent that a debt restructuring happens without an IMF program, it is rare, but it can happen then we would not be having all of this discussion of a IMF DSA because it would not be related to the fund's lending decision. So before getting into uh, the DSA and its relationship with the fund's lending, uh, I just wanted to make sure that we understand the space that we are talking about. Now, very often, uh, in fact, almost always, a debt restructuring happens in the context of an IMF a program. And the reason is not just that um, uh, more often than not, the debtor that is in financial distress needs lending from the lender of last resort. It is also often needed because before private creditors decide to provide any relief to a debtor that is in distress, they need to have the assurance that the debtor will be undertaking reforms, particularly uh, difficult structural reforms that were delayed and in fact were the reason why the debtor had an unsustainable debt situation and needed to come uh, to the creditors to ask them to provide debt uh, relief. Now, when we talk about therefore a country, the most typical example, which is in debt distress, uh, has uh, waited too long to address its debt problems and has come to the IMF to seek assistance, it is important to remember that the fund has a lending decision to make. That's a, it's, it's, it's very important to remember what is the role of the fund. And ultimately in this context, it is that the fund has to make a lending decision. Now the manner in which the fund makes that decision and the amount that it decides to lend and the timing in which it lends essentially also determines the contours and the parameters of the debt restructuring that would be undertaken. Now from, the IMF's Articles of Agreement, before the IMF can lend, at least two goals need to be met, and they come straight from its articles. One is that the fund feels confident that the member has put together a program of policies that is going to address the balance of payments problems that led the member to seek assistance from the IMF. The second is that the fund needs to be assured that it is lending under adequate safeguards. In other words, that the fund feels confident that the member will be able to repay the fund in full and on time. Now, when you think about both of these considerations, that there is a program of policies to address the underlying balance of payments difficulties and that there are safeguards, it follows immediately that the fund can only lend if the fund believes that debt is sustainable under the program. Just to make sure this point is clear, if debt is not sustainable, it is definitely not the case that the member has put in place a program of policies that is addressing the underlying balance of payments difficulties, the first criterion that I mentioned. And if debt is not sustainable, it is also clear that the fund would not have adequate safeguards for lending to this country because lending to a country where debt is not sustainable does not provide the assurances that the lender would be repaid. So the key point that I wanted to make was that from its articles of agreement, the IMF requires before it lends that debt is considered to be sustainable. In most of the cases, when a member approaches the IMF, such a judgment does not require debt restructuring because the member's program usually, the combination of adjustment and financing that is put together can give these assurances without the need for any debt restructuring. And it is in a minority of cases that 
the judgment is made that debt can only be considered to be sustainable if the member decides that it will need to restructure its debt. Now, having made the first point that in such circumstances, the IMF can only lend when debt is sustainable, leads me to my second point, which is that if the circumstances are such and the members' needs are such that it requires a large amount of financial assistance from the IMF, which in IMF terminology is called exceptional access or lending in large amounts, then it follows from what I said previously that the funds bar on determining debt sustainability is also higher. In other words, fund policy requires that if the fund is to grant exceptional access to a member, i.e. lend a large amount, then one of the four conditions that has to be met is that the IMF has to come to a judgment that not only is the member's debt considered sustainable, it's considered sustainable with high probability. And this higher bar for higher lending then establishes three zones of debt sustainability that come about from a DSA. The first or the worst that you can consider or the red zone is if a judgment is that debt is not sustainable. In that case, the fund cannot lend as I was seeking to explain earlier. That's a situation with the worst debt outlook. On the other end of the spectrum is a situation where the fund is confident about the debt sustainability of the member and considers not only that debt is sustainable, that it is sustainable with high probability. In other words, all the indicators that the fund uses to determine debt sustainability are such that the IMF is very constant, very confident about the sustainability of the member's debt. So these two are the ends of the spectrum. On the one hand, where debt is unsustainable or the red zone. On the other hand, the green zone, where the fund is very confident about debt sustainability and can make that judgment that debt is sustainable with high probability. This leaves a gray zone in the middle where um, it is possible that the member circumstances are such that the fund's judgment is that debt is sustainable, but that statement cannot be made. That judgment is not that debt is sustainable with high probability. Now, the way this relates to the IMF lending is that if the IMF, and I'm going to simplify a, a little bit because uh, the policy is a bit more intricate than how I am presenting it, but for ease of discussion, I wanted to make the discussion not too complicated. If a country is in the red zone, the fund cannot lend at all unless the member then decides to undertake a restructuring. If the fund has to lend a large amount, which is to provide exceptional access, then the restructuring has to be such that not only it establishes debt sustainability, it establishes debt sustainability with high probability, i.e. moves the country from the red zone to the green zone. And finally, if the fund is providing financial assistance, which is not of exceptional access, it is sufficient that the fund and the program of policies that is put in place is one that just is establishes debt sustainability. So before getting into some of the other issues about what is the content of the DSA and how the DSA is used, I wanted to, as a first step, take some time to address the question of why and how is an assessment of debt sustainability relevant for the fund's lending uh, decision. Let me then move on to the second point that I wanted to make, which is about what role does the DSA play in the restructuring process and in particular, the interactions between the debtor and creditors. Uh, I will walk you through a typical process. It is by no means the only process um, because each country's circumstances are different. But the goal is to uh, 
share with you some of the sequencing that occurs. When a member country reaches out to the fund for requesting financial assistance, and the nature of the circumstances is such that the country's debt situation is, ass is assessed to be in the red zone and some form of a debt restructuring will be required, the fund undertakes its analysis. And um, the analysis consists of two perhaps equally important parts. One part, you could consider the adjustment, which means what are the policies that the country will undertake? And these are not only macroeconomic policies, but critically structural reforms. What are all these adjustment measures that the country will undertake that will address the underlying reasons that led the country to experience debt distress and seek financing from the IMF? The other equally important part is financing. Given that the country is undertaking adjustment and sometimes painful and politically costly reforms, what is the package of financing that is going to be put together to support the members' policies? In the part of financing, there are two key tables that the fund staff produce that, is, that determine the parameters of that financing. One is the table called the balance of payments, and you'll find them in every single staff report. And the balance of payments table is, ex is extremely important because it is at the core of the fund's mandate. The fund primarily exists to address balance of payments difficulties of members. And the second key um, table or set of tables that the fund produces is the debt sustainability analysis. These two tables together, together with a few others, but I especially wanted to highlight the importance of these two tables, they determine, amongst other things, that the envelope of resources that is available to the debtor to service the claims of creditors. Now, once the DSA in particular has been developed by the IMS staff and discussed with the country authorities, it often becomes a point of contention. And it often becomes a point of contention, particularly with private creditors. And it often becomes so because private creditors often can be heard to express the concern that the incentives are often such for the official sector that the larger the debt relief in the DSA that is required, particularly of private creditors, the greater the prospects that in particular, the more senior creditors and the official creditors will be repaid. And, uh, and uh, these discussions often you know, can become contentious. Um, they are at the very, very heart of the tensions in the debt restructuring process. With regards to bilateral official creditors, back in the days when the bulk of the bilateral official creditors claims used to come from Paris club member countries. And given the historical and uh, working relationships between the IMF staff and Paris club. So for instance, when I was at the IMF and I was the head of the debt policy division, part of what I, uh, my responsibilities included was also the representative of the IMF to the Paris club and every, two months, I would uh, represent the IMF in the meetings of the Paris Club. My point is that there was a well-established practice where these issues would not arise as much between the Paris Club and the IMF regarding the role of the DSA and how it was making the determination about the resources available to service the claims of the non-IMF creditors. The creditor official credit landscape, as you all would be familiar, has changed a lot considerably. And now the majority of the bilateral official claims, particularly on poor countries, emanate not from Paris Club countries, but from new countries, new creditors, such as China, such as the Middle East, such as others. And, and that process has also become more complicated. Arrangements like the common framework that the G20 introduced are attempts to try to make that process better coordinated. We can discuss that separately if needed. But I wanted to bring out the second point, which is important, that the DSA often uh, 
after having determined the role that it plays in the fund's lending decision, and particularly the zones of sustainability that need to be established depending upon the amount of lending that the IMF is going to do, it also becomes a very important point or tool or table in creditor-debtor uh, discussions. The DSA uh, ultimately uh, is shared by the IMF when the staff report is published. But that comes at the end, after not only the adjustment policies have been agreed, but secondly, the member has also gotten the financing assurances from the creditors, i.e. written or verbal statements that the other creditors will be providing the financing in form of debt relief that is needed for the program to be supported. It is after that that the fund staff take the program to the board and after the board meeting, the documents uh, related to the program are published, including uh, the including the the debt sustainability analysis. In my experience, having worked on the on the debt restructurings from the debt policy side, which is the division which um, needs to ensure even handedness of treatment across countries, it is not the area department that is on the forefront but is uh, the sign of department that ensures consistency with fund policy. My experience has been that if a member and also fund staff um, make themselves available for discussions, particularly with private creditors, at least explaining what are some of the assumptions that the fund staff and the authorities are making, key macroeconomic assumptions, for undertaking the analysis of the DSA, as well as the balance of payments, that, that those efforts go a considerable way to give confidence to the private creditors in particular, that efforts are being made to share with them as much information as possible. And in my view, uh, making sure that the debt restructuring process is such that those efforts continue to be made, even if the DSA cannot be shared, but making uh, oneself available to explain the assumptions underlying the analysis go a considerable way towards generating sufficient participation of creditors, which ultimately will be required for the member to be able to take the program to the board. So my second point uh, was about how the DSA becomes very important in the whole process. So having spoken about why the DSA is relevant and how it's relevant for the funds lending decision, second about what role does it play in the process, then I wanted to just um, talk uh, quickly about some of the important aspects of um, the debt sustainability analysis, some points about the content. Uh, how does the fund staff make its assessment? And uh, I also wanted to you know, just share with you um, a output of the DSA from Sri Lanka, just to make it more concrete. And um, I'm going back to the deck that I had, and the last published DSA from the IMF on Sri Lanka dates back to February of March of last year. And it was then done um, in uh, the IMF's market access DSA framework, that framework has subsequently been reformed and more bells and whistles have been added to it. I'm flipping through the slides about, uh, you know, the approach for, um, you know, low-income versus market access countries. The IMF uses a different methodology. Um, market access countries, uh, there is a need for a different methodology because market access countries, the, the determination of debt sustainability is informed by considerations of market access, which is not the case in low-income countries where debt is mostly concessional and uh, information about interest rates in the market and other market-based indicators are not that relevant for making a judgment. Um, so these slides primarily talk about what are some of the core elements of the debt sustainability framework for low-income countries uh, versus for market access countries. Um, but I want to maybe get ahead to this slide, which is the output of the DSA that was published in February of uh, 2022. And this is the 
the previous template of the market access uh, uh, DSA framework, as I mentioned, there have been more bells and whistles added to it. And this is one of the outputs, and this is a heat map. And um, if you look at the top figure, and it shows, first of all, the, the, the debt level. And uh, if you look at that row, this can either be, um, the colors can either be green or yellow or red. The second row is gross financing needs which refers to the total amount that the country has to raise, which is the sum of its overall budget deficit, as well as the amortization of its debt on a residual maturity basis, the total rollover needs of the government, plus the financing. And the last row is the debt profile, and this refers to in addition to just the debt level and the total gross financing needs, what is the foreign exchange component of the debt? What is the short-term versus long-term tenure of the debt? How much of the debt is held by non-residents and related points? My point is that even if you look at the DSA back in February, um, it is reasonably clear that uh, debt would not, there are serious risks to the debt outlook. And uh, if you read the DSA document, fund staff also starts off by noting that debt is not sustainable in Sri Lanka. Now, I've been using the word uh, sustainable and unsustainable. And Manjuka asked me to clarify in particular, does that equate to solvency and insolvency? And um, it does not. And the concepts of solvency and insolvency do not translate very readily from the corporate world to the sovereign world, because in theory, a sovereign has unlimited power to tax. And with that unlimited power to tax, it can theoretically be able to raise the resources that are needed to meet its needs. The reason the DSA is a judgment at the end of the day, and not only a mechanical exercise, because it requires a judgment on the part of the fund staff as to what amount of adjustment is feasible by the member country to meet its financing needs. And that is a judgment that needs to take into account socio-political considerations as well. It also needs to take into account the track record and the history of the particular country that the IMF is engaged in. Now, um, I'm happy if there is a further interest to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how, you know, which concepts of corporate solvency and insolvency carry over and which concepts do not. But I wanted to address that point. I spoke briefly about the role of judgment um, and wanted to just maybe underscore that even if you look at the output of the new template from uh, the IMF, there are a whole host of mechanical tools that will give an output on debt sustainability. And they will also, in fact, demonstrate which of the zones of debt sustainability does staff think the member's debt profile is uh, uh, lands in, whether it lands in the green zone or the gray zone or the red zone. But in addition, you will also see that there is always the room preserved for uh, judgment to be exercised by staff as well. I There are many, many other aspects about the content of the DSA. Um, and in fact, the IMF offers training uh, to member countries on how to run the DSA methodology. But perhaps I should stop here in the interest of time, Manjuka, and happy to take any questions uh, now or even later. Thank you. Thank you, Reza. I think I uh, probably Sergey is waiting. So I thank you for the insightful, uh, uh, insightful presentation and bring to bear your exp experience in running the DSA, designing the DSA, and running the debt division. I mean, Sri Lankan that is very insightful. It's almost almost on the horse's mouth, and thank you for that. I mean, uh, I would now now like to invite Sergey to uh, make his presentation. Sergey will speak on the current restructurings at. In, in Zambia, Ghana, and in Sri Lanka. Sergio will also speak about Argentina, Ecuador, where he is a keen observer of it. And he would also speak on what has, in his perspective, from a market perspective, what can go wrong 
the DSA. Thank you. Over to you, Sajid. Thank you, Manchuka, and uh, thank you to the Bar Association for uh, having me here today. I'm going to use a few slides on uh, the topics uh, Manchuka mentioned. I'll also say a bit at the beginning about what the situation today is in Sri Lanka from the perspective of uh, financing international reserves and all these things. But before I start, I think one very important point is that so here today we are speaking about what restructuring looks like, what it should look like, what's happened in other countries. Uh, the critical thing is that when you are in these things and you're either the government, the IMF, or the bondholders, this turns a bit into an art. It's negotiation. So you often see things that from the distance don't look optimal and in hindsight are easy to criticize. But when you are in it, constraints pop up all over the place. So it is much easier today to be telling you what things look like, what has been wrong in the past, and actually being in the field trying to do it right. So bear in mind that in a few months, or hopefully not more than months, when the situation in Sri Lanka is resolved, uh, it will most likely look far from optimal if you take a bit of a textbook approach, but it will most likely reflect the reality of all these stakeholders pushing for what they uh, for what they think is best for uh, for them, right? So um, let me show you some slides. Uh, share the screen. Uh, perfect. So a couple of things. Uh, Two main things I want to uh, talk about. One is uh, what Sri Lanka looks like and how it relates to uh, recent cases. Some are ongoing, like Ghana and Zambia. And then some thoughts on what can go wrong in these cases. And I want to touch up on debt levels and targets you set on financing needs and how much you need to refinance. Number two, what happens if you're optimistic, too optimistic, or policies just don't work at all? And number three, I think this is an area where uh, Sean will likely have lots of thoughts, is what happens uh, with credit or coordination these days? As uh, Reza was saying, uh, it's no longer a G7 game on the official lending part. So things have got a bit more complicated in, uh, in recent years. So first of all, uh, on Sri Lanka and what, uh, what things look like at the moment. So there's no debt restructuring that is an easy situation. If you can pay your debts, you pay them. No one tries to renegotiate them if the situation isn't stressful in, in some way. And that applies to corporates, to countries, and to our mortgages, right? What makes Sri Lanka complicated? The, the country literally spent all the dollars it had in the piggy bank paying bills that were due in dollars and not taking painful policy decisions preemptively to try and not fall off the cliff. So the country kept going and going. And you know, back then there was a chance that this could work if things improved, but they didn't, right? And part of it was COVID, many waves, tourism not recovering. But if you look at international reserves, they plunged uh, starting in the late 2019, and now they're basically flat. And they're flat because this tells you that the billion or two left for some reason is encumbered, so it can't be used. And this is why you are seeing, you've seen, and unfortunately, all of you have experienced a huge economic crisis. And you, know, you can put it in charts and it summarizes partially what's happened. So for example, you look at how much oil Sri Lanka imported last year, it was something like 30% below uh, normal levels before the pandemic. 
And that tells you that you know, something's very wrong. There's no economy that can work uh, using 30% less oil than before. Certainly not in the space of two years. Maybe in 20 years when everyone drives a Tesla and everything is electric, perhaps. But this kind of thing tells you that the country doesn't have dollars to pay its debts or to finance the things it needs to bring in from, from abroad. And redressing this situation will not be easy. And it has implications for debt restructuring, right? The IMF will probably say things like, okay, so Sri Lanka not only needs to pay some debt back, it also needs to rebuild international reserves. So it needs dollars, not just to pay ongoing bills, it also needs them to rebuild its buffers. So that basically increases the number of things to be done and makes it more complicated to, uh, to get the IMF and, uh, and some official lenders to agree that it is possible to start paying uh, foreign debt again uh, quickly. So important thing to keep in mind, that, for example, compared to Ecuador, Sri Lanka's default and restructuring is not preemptive, quote unquote, at all, which makes things uh, complicated. Now, where, where does Sri Lanka stand in terms of how much debt there is at the moment? If you look at the debt ratio to GDP, to the size of the economy, the number is very high, uh, mostly because there's been a lot of depreciation. So all this debt in dollars keeps growing relative to GDP, which is in rupees. So it's a very high number. It's 120 or, or so. As a reference, uh, Kenya is at 70% now, Ecuador at 60%. Uh, now, later on, I'll, I'll actually argue that this ratio is sometimes overemphasized, but it is nevertheless important. So being at 120 is, is a lot. And you know, it tells you that the starting situation is a, is a very complicated one. Uh, just so you have a reference point, when maybe six or seven years ago, Italy's debt was 130% of GDP, there was a lot of concern in the euro area and everywhere else. And that's a country that has the backing of the ECB, a currency that is backed by France, Germany, et cetera, et cetera. And this level of debt was a source of concern. Uh, so Sri Lanka at 120 is really, uh, is really a lot. Uh, now, the other critical thing to assess in these situations is not just how much debt I have, it's also how much I need to refinance every year and how much more I need to borrow additional to finance my imports, my fiscal deficit, and anything I spend above my income. Uh, and this is called gross financing needs. And the problem with those is that if you don't have market access, you are unable to borrow from anyone, from uh, bondholders, from the IMF until you have uh, a debt restructuring deal, when China doesn't want to lend anymore. There's basically no level of gross financing needs that is sustainable. And that's, that's Sri Lanka's situation today, right? It's unable to borrow a penny. So it's unable to roll over debt or borrow any money to spend more than, uh, more than the revenue the government gets. Uh, now, another important thing that I'll discuss later on is what's the composition of this bar on the left, right? And uh, here you can see that on the right, like on the external part, bonds are a big part of Sri Lanka's debt. Multilateral debt is also big. That's basically IMF, ADB, 
and company. And also, uh, non-Paris club lenders are very, very big. China is probably close to $9 billion. Uh, so that that's, can be a source of complications. And in Zambia, for example, it's been a really, really uh, critical issue. So that's a bit of background on the situation in Sri Lanka for uh, you know, people who are not doing uh, economics all, all day long. So what does Sri Lanka need to do from, uh, from here? It basically needs creditors to agree basically on two things to simplify. One is what kind of debt level can be sustainable in a few years, how much this 120% needs to come down. Along the way, how much I can pay every year in interest or uh, in principle. And then given these parameters and the plans Sri Lanka has on fiscal policy, how much uh, Sri Lankan creditors think the country can grow, then you have to find a debt deal. You have to find a set of restructured financial instruments that are consistent with these things you've agreed, that they take debt down to X percent, that they make uh, debt service every year not more than Y percent of GDP, and that you know, it's consistent with the degree of fiscal consolidation the country is willing to do, et cetera, et cetera. And this, this is the process Sri Lanka is uh, at the moment. And there is no official communication of what these goalposts are. Uh, but if you go by uh, the letter from India to the IMF that leaked, that was basically a letter where India says, tells the IMF, we have you know, agreement or not sure what to call it. We, we've discussed with Sri Lanka what to do with the debt the US, and we think that there's a way forward that is consistent with a set of parameters. And these parameters are uh, what you see here, uh, bringing debt down to 95% of GDP by 2032, Financing needs, what I was describing before, no more than 13% of GDP uh, in the next few years, and uh, affects that service of no more than 4.5% of GDP. Now, without that restructuring, Sri Lanka doesn't meet any of these things, right? Uh, now, uh, my reaction and most, many people's reaction to these targets is, well, they don't look very demanding. And I'm sure there's people inside the IMF who think they are certainly not demanding. Uh, and that's, that's because if that ratio looks high, it may or may not be a serious constraint uh, for success that it's high. I'll discuss this a bit more. Uh, and because it is a target in 2032, which is in a long, long time. Uh, for comparison, Ghana is also trying to reduce its debt ratio by about 20 something percentage points. But important differences, it is doing it, wants to do it faster than Sri Lanka by 2028, and it's doing it lower levels of debt, right? So what Sri Lanka is doing a priori, and if these are the parameters, is not among the most demanding set of targets uh, in the history of restructuring. Even though you know, the comparison with Ghana is one that you should take with a grain of salt, Sri Lanka's level of development at least by IMF definitions, is higher. So the, its capacity to carry debt is higher. But 
you know, these are parameters that are not the toughest in history. And for example, if you look at, you know, these effects that service variable, how much will it be in dollars? Uh, so in 2027, this will likely be $4 billion in uh, effects that service. Uh, if you compare that to how much Sri Lanka was supposed to pay in 2024, you find that the amounts are more or less similar. So it's not, there's not a big reduction in the amounts due every year. Uh, the trick is making all these things operational while you know, making sure that it all adds up and that the amount of money the IMF is putting on the table is enough to actually make uh, this work. But that's basically most people's reaction was, okay, that's not very demanding. Uh, that said, you're still, we are still seeing very low bond prices in the market. And that tells you that either there isn't full confidence that this is actually the set of goalposts or number two, that people expect negotiations to achieve something of that sort to be long and complicated, hence uh, bonds uh, trade at, at low prices. So, so Sri Lanka needs to get this done or achieve a different set of parameters, but that will still look at these things, that ratio financing needs and effects that service. And how to get there, as I was saying before, at one point will be very much negotiation and art, not really economic science, if economics is a science, or a, or principles, right? It will be, uh, can be a quite a complicated process. Now, as also as reference points, what, uh, and let me, let me maybe skip that and we can go back to exit yields uh, later on if, uh, if we have time. As a reference points of how others have done this uh, recently. Ecuador in 2020, for example, it's, Considered in hindsight an easy negotiation within the world of uh, debt restructuring. And that's because it was relatively preemptive and because it was a lot about a bunch of maturities coming due in very few years, as opposed to a very high. Uh, that ratio or a situation that was very unsustainable economically. How was uh, the thing resolved? Uh, there was a principal haircut on bonds of 9%. So some haircut, but not massive. And coupons were cut on average from 9 to 5%. So that was a significant decline in coupons and maturities were extended um, quite a bit. Now, uh, in this Ecuador situation, China was a very important creditor, which at the beginning gave assurances to everyone that they would help Ecuador. And then this help didn't materialize for a while. Ecuador stayed afloat with an IMF program that actually went quite well. And it wasn't until uh, late last year that China gave a deal to Ecuador that basically extended maturities. And as you can see, that lowered the amounts Ecuador has to pay uh, now quite a bit, right? For example, this quarter, the amounts due are down from half a percentage point of GDP before China restructured to now 0.2%. So very manageable. So Ecuador, an example of something that was quite consensual, not the most complicated in, in history. Now, Argentina, 
opposite example. Uh, the country got in an, into an IMF program in mid 2018. It was a very optimistic set of IMF targets and policy adjustment and everything, backed by amounts of money that were not very high given the size of the problem. And uh, this, pro this IMF program didn't work. And the situation basically got critical in August 2019, at which point Argentina uh, defaulted. Uh, it took quite a while to resolve it, uh, in part because there was COVID in the middle, right? So it's tempting to criticize, but the global situation was uh, complicated. And in this case, since Argentina needed the IMF, the IMF was a very central actor in establishing what sustainability means. And in this case, in March 2020, when the bonds were still in default, the IMF came out with a debt sustainability analysis and said, this is what sustainability should look like in Argentina. Number one, to make things a bit easier, they excluded central government debt held by other parts of the public sector, pension funds, for example. Then they said gross financing needs shouldn't be more than 5% of GDP. That's a low number. Past restructurings, for example, Ukraine in 2014, I believe was something like maybe 10, 12%. Uh, the targets in this India letter uh, on Sri Lanka are much higher than that, for example, right? Uh, FX that service, also very tight uh, target, 3% of GDP. And uh, the fund thought that should stabilize below 40%, excluding everything held by pension funds, et cetera, et cetera, by 2030. Uh, so a deal was done. Uh, it was a tough one for uh, bondholders because coupons really fell a lot, actually to zero initially. So the loss in present value was about 50% or so. Uh, now, did it work? Uh, no, because Argentina's policies continue to be a disaster. And that's going to be one of my points on what can go wrong, is that you can restructure as much as you want, that if the country doesn't have a responsible government, the only sustainable level of debt is zero, absolute zero, right? If no one trusts you, no one will ever lend money to you. You won't be able to even pay tiny coupons on very small amounts of money. So at the moment, uh, Argentina's bonds are still trading more than 15 percentage points above US treasuries. So basically at levels that are completely incompatible with issuing new bonds. So the situation basically remains unresolved despite a pretty tough deal for, uh, for lenders. Now, uh, moving on in my last part of the presentation on what can go wrong in these situations. Uh, first, some thoughts on something that is not really going wrong or not is that Typically, for many years, there was a lot of emphasis on debt ratios when people looked at debt restructuring, or at least economies. And that's something that always puzzled uh, bond traders who came from the corporate sector, right? Where for them, it's all about the flows and gross financing needs and can this adapt or not. Uh, the IMF has shifted its focus a lot on financing needs over the years. So that's a bit less of a problem now, but still, you know, sometimes there's too much focus, I think, on 
making the debt ratio X, forgetting a bit too much about how much debt is domestic, how much is held by the central bank, which will always, always roll over, et cetera, et cetera. If you ask me what's the absolutely critical thing to do in these situations is to look at your financing needs in billion dollars, not in percent of GDP, which is one thing that you have to project and is unclear. You also have to project financing needs, but at least it's only one variable. And compare them to the likely disbursements that the IMF or private creditors can give you and see how these two things stack up in the next 10 years or, um, or so. Uh, second thing that can get complicated in these cases is that what do you assume in a spreadsheet to make that hit the target you've set and to make financing needs in seven years be what you want them to be? Honest answer is, who knows what's going to happen in seven years, right? No one has a clue, not even the IMF. Problem is that sometimes if you push your assumptions to the limit, you make them really optimistic. Like, for example, Argentina wanted to improve uh, its fiscal balance by almost 5% of GDP. Uh, what does the average IMF program achieve? 1% of GDP. Was it going to work in a country with a horrible track record? No, it was not going to work. Now, there are many cases in the gray zone, right? But if you set targets that are overly ambitious or policies are bad, then it's not going to work. Argentina, Lebanon, Venezuela, you know, policies are so bad that, you know, nothing else can really, uh, can really fix it. And finally, uh, creditor coordination. Uh, in the past, this was an issue with bondholders, right? Now that you have collective action clauses, less so among bondholders. What's the issue now? That we have big official lenders who are not G7 and who you know, may have different objectives than the US, the IMF, or Europe. Zambia, uh, where almost 40% of that was held by China, is still an ongoing problem. It's been stuck for quite a while. Sri Lanka, not as extreme as Zambia when it comes to debt to China, but substantial. Ghana, a lot smaller, so maybe a chance that this area is not um, a problem. Uh, let me stop here, Manjuka, not talk too much about, not pontificate about what the solution to this problem is. We can do it in the Q&A and others will uh, have more thoughts than me on that for, uh, for sure. Thank you, Reza. Thank you, Sergei. I always enjoy you. So you I see, I always think you have a much more critical view of uh, the IMF and always takes on what the IMF uh, says. And this, I, I, I thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, yeah, I now would like to invite Ian Clark. Ian would like to speak about, uh, he would touch on the uh, DSA, DSA, DSA parameters, and he would talk, uh, talk about whether the role, the I, whether the IM creditors have more say in the formulation of the DSA, and it also sort of the, the in thing these days, debt to nature swaps, and the role it plays, it plays in the debt restructure, and the role, uh, what role does the instrument Instruments are value recovery and state contingent, instru contingent instruments play in bringing about agreements with debtors and credit or creditors. And I have the extreme pleasure of inviting uh, Ian. Ian's, uh, Ian, I must, uh, Ian would encourage me to part, put this together. So I have, I have extreme pleasure and honor of inviting Ian to make a presentation. Well, th uh, thank you, Manjuka, for that kind uh, uh, presentation of, uh, of myself and, and thank you to the Bar Association for inviting me to uh, participate in this important event. Um, just before I address those specific topics, I, I did want to react to one point, uh, if, if I may, that, that Sergey made. 
uh, relating to the Argentine debt restructuring, uh, where we were also involved in in that situation in in advising uh, bondholders, and I and I think I would just uh, observe that it was indeed an extremely painful uh, deal for the bondholders at the time. They took a very significant haircut, uh, certainly NPV haircut on their positions. Uh, and subsequent to that, the bonds have traded terribly and were, you know, are now indicative of, of a full scale debt crisis in that country. And the lesson that bondholders have taken from that example is that uh, a debt restructuring without the underpinning of an IMF program is inherently very risky. And the, the reason for that is that, you know, you know, whatever, however well-meaning politicians may be, uh, without the discipline of a program where they have have to comply with certain conditionalities for ongoing compliance with the program, for ongoing disbursements under the program, it is, you know, it's very tempting for politicians to pocket the gains from a debt restructuring and then move on. And, uh, and so maybe one lesson that has come from that unhappy experience in Argentina, which may be relevant in Sri Lanka and other cases that we're seeing around the world now, is that uh, bondholders will be very skeptical about moving ahead without the the, the backing of a, a full program, however painful that may mean the recoveries uh, for, for bondholders. But without that, there's just too much uncertainty to... Uh, for them to justify upfront pain. So uh, in any case, that's sort of by the by, it was just a reaction to, uh, uh, I think, Sergey's absolutely correct comments about that uh, process. Um, turning to uh, the, 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 the topics that uh, Manjuka had asked me to, to comment on, I'll, I'll try to run through them relatively quickly here because I know we, we don't have infinite time. But they're they're each very interesting and complicated subjects in their own right. Um, the first uh, the first question relates to what we call the debt perimeter, um, which is which is to say, once a sovereign has decided that it has to restructure its debts, um, how do you actually implement that? What what is the landscape of debts that you include in the restructuring process? And that decision is is separate and distinct from uh, the the points that we've been uh, hearing about relating to the the DSA and and the debt relief that has to be um, a, a agreed by the sovereign and accepted by creditors in order to return a country to debt sustainability. Because what the IMF does not do when it um, when it agrees a, a DSA framework and indeed a program with uh, with its uh, so with sovereign debtors, is insist on specific debt treatment for specific creditors or specific classes of creditors. They leave that question to the negotiation between the sovereign debtor and its creditors. So an an important you know in trying to achieve the targets in the DSA. It's very important to, to decide what is the universe of debt that is going to bear the burden that is implied by the debt sustainability analysis. So we have four broad categories of, of creditors um, that that you know most sovereign debtors will, will see. We have multilateral creditors uh, who, uh, for a variety of, of historic and policy reasons, are excluded generally from a debt restructuring process. You know, there have been occasions where they've been included, but that in, in the HIPAA uh, program in Africa, but in, in general, uh, and certainly in Sri Lanka's case, you wouldn't expect to see, for example, the IMF or the World Bank or Asian Development Bank, you know, accepting any haircuts on their positions. Then you have official creditors, uh, and we've heard uh, we've heard a lot about the official creditors, the Paris Club, the traditional uh, official lending uh, partners of countries, and now supplemented by the non-Paris Club official creditors, you know, China, India, Saudi, and so forth. Um, these are you know a separate category of policy-based lenders who more often than not are included 
uh, in a debt restructuring because uh, they comprise a very significant proportion of, of the debt stock of, of a, of a um, distressed sovereign. Uh, the third category is what I would call commercial creditors, uh, external commercial creditors in particular. And th this will include uh, international sovereign bondholders uh, and also lenders under bilateral or syndicated loan facilities. Uh, again, generally all FX denominated. Uh, these are commercial rates of, of interest and commercial terms set by the market. And, you know, almost inevitably in every restructuring, you'll see this category targeted in the restructuring plan. And then the final category that I would mention, um, which is uh, an interesting one, and that is uh, becoming increasingly relevant, perhaps, in, in the uh, current discussions in Sri Lanka and uh, Ghana and, and other uh, countries going through restructuring now, is domestic debt. So th this is a whole category of debt, uh, which comprises uh, obligations generally denominated in local currency, uh, treasury bills, treasury bonds, a variety of instruments issued by the government, uh, many of which are subscribed by local banks, uh, uh, local pension funds, and sometimes even uh, the central bank itself, uh, who will uh, provide what's called monetary, direct monetary financing of the budget to, to countries that are in severe distress and will accumulate you know, big obligations uh, of the of the government on its own balance balance sheet. So, domestic debt is um, is another important category that is sometimes included and sometimes excluded from the restructuring process. Um, the what what's obviously important, it's almost self evident, is that the broader the the, the base of creditors that participate in a restructuring. Uh, the less the burden is on any particular uh, segment of creditors. So if you exclude uh, you know, large numbers of creditors for one reason or another, um, for example, if you take the policy decision to exclude domestic creditors from a restructuring, then the burden that is placed on the external creditors becomes that much greater. And the burden of complying with the DSA, the implications of the DSA become that much more difficult. Uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, just you know, to take that as an example, there's a very large component of, of domestic debt in the debt stock of the government. And it tends to be very expensive debt and short-term debt and has very significant implications on particularly the, the, GFM, the GFM targets uh, uh, of, of Sri Lanka and how they'll be able to continue servicing their debt going forward. A decision will need to be taken um, by Sri Lanka, you know, in and is you know part of the debate. But we're not. Uh, I'm not weighing in on specifically here, but just to explain the context, the debate is whether some uh, some effort should be made to bring those creditors within the debt restructuring perimeter, so that. Uh, the, the DSA targets can be more readily uh, achieved and in a more equitable basis by spreading the burden uh, uh, of restructuring across a broader category of, of creditors than just the external creditors. Now, making that type of choice, though, always has uh, important implications for uh, the domestic uh, the domestic sector, because if you're restructuring the debt owed to local banks for a sovereign that is in distress. Uh, this may create uh, stresses on the financial system. Uh, it may create capitalization and profitability problems uh, for, for those financial institutions, uh, which are the very ones that the country will be relying on to lend to the real economy and to help generate you know, economic growth going forward. So it's a it's a delicate policy decision to take for any sovereign whether to include domestic debt in the restructuring perimeter because there are spillover impacts of of including those types of instruments in in the restructuring. Um, there are ways to mitigate 
that type of problem. Uh, both regulatory and accounting forbearance can be applied to sort of mitigate the impact on the balance sheets and profitability of, of local financial institutions. Uh, that's just one example. Um, and you can, uh, you know, basically structure the restructuring in a way so that you're just extending maturities and not looking at nominal haircuts. But it's a complicated picture. So uh, to sum up, you know, one of the key decisions that will have to be taken once an IMF program is in place and the restructuring in Sri Lanka goes ahead is, you know, where is the burden of that restructuring going to fall? Is it just on the external creditors or will the domestic creditors need to participate in some way uh, as well? Um, the next point uh, that I wanted to quickly touch on is the, the question of involvement of uh, of creditors and particularly private creditors in the DSA formulation. And on this, I, I would you know just say the following. Um, I think there's uh, there's plainly an appreciation, I think from all stakeholders that the the DSA uh, and the IMF program is fundamentally, a uh, a matter for the debtor country uh, in question and the IMF, which is providing funding as you know the lender of last resort, effectively. Uh, creditors have a perspective that is uh, you know as to what is uh, you know realistic and achievable. They also have valuable perspectives on the potential growth trajectories for the country, the, the potential refinancing costs once the economy stabilizes. They have, I think, perspectives that can be value, uh, valuably uh, added into the consideration of DSA targets and the program parameters. Um, but I, I don't think I would suggest, and I don't think most private creditors would suggest that they should have a formal role in the preparation of a DSA. Now, that, you know, all that being said, I think there, um, you know, there plainly has been a problem, uh, it may be a, a more of a perception problem than anything, but certainly a problem in that um, there's an inform what we would call an information asymmetry in the current debt restructuring architecture, which is to say, you know, the DSA uh, that is uh, that is being uh, implemented between the debtor and the IMF uh, before it is approved by the board and effectively becomes public is negotiated uh, is shared with. The official creditors who are providing financing assurances, who can look at it, uh, take it into account when giving their financing commitments to support the program. But there isn't a similar process because that information is confidential until the board uh, of the IMF uh, approves the program. Um, it, 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 that information is not shared in the same time you know, time frame, time horizon with the private uh, sector creditors. And this can lead to a perception that private creditors have no real say in the DSA and effectively simply are taking whatever is left, you know, in terms of the residual effort needed to get a, a program implemented effectively. Uh, and, and this, you know, th th this is not helpful in terms of reaching a, a quick and speedy conclusion, it's much, I think, more beneficial where the private creditors feel that they have an understanding of, of the DSA and have had an ability to comment on it, even if they don't have a right to participate in its formulation. Um, the third point, um, debt for nature swaps, I won't dwell on much because I, I, I want to get to the last point. Uh, debt for nature swaps uh, are obviously increasingly uh, seen as an important element in in sovereign debt restructuring for countries which have you know significant uh, natural assets 
uh, the increased focus on ESG and and you know related considerations uh, amongst investors helps to complement the, the the priority placed by by countries and international stakeholders on preserving those assets. So finding a way to channel some of the debt relief that is provided by creditors into you know uh, into preserving the environment. You know, around the margins, I think is a very important goal. Um, the truth is that sovereign debt restructuring is and probably will remain, you know, primarily a a uh, an effort to restore debt sustainability and fiscal and financial stability for countries going through it. And I don't think the debt for nature swaps will ever be sort of a fundamental component of you know, resolving a complex uh, debt restructuring like uh, Sri Lanka's. But certainly that's a subject that, that could be talked about in more detail. Um, now, the final point, um, which is itself, you know, a very complicated subject is the role of, of VRIs, value recovery instruments, and state contingent debt instruments in sovereign debt restructuring. Um, first of all, a word about VRIs. Um, you know, historically, value recovery instruments, uh, typically in the form of uh, GDP-linked uh, securities or uh, oil or other commodity-linked uh, securities, you know, have been used to compensate creditors, commercial creditors, for the upfront nominal haircuts that they accept in a debt restructuring um, on their aggregate claims. So if a if if commercial creditors are asked in the debt restructuring to, to write off a portion of the principal and past due interest uh, calculated on a contractual basis for their claims, then one of the ways that uh, has developed in the market to, to get them comfortable with that is to give them a value recovery instrument. And the value recovery instrument, and let us say it's linked to uh, something like GDP, which is very typical. We've seen in Ukraine and Greece and Argentina. Um, what this will, will give the creditors is an instrument that in the case uh, the debtor outperforms the program, the underlying program parameters on which the debt restructuring is based, it will give the holders of the instrument an ability to participate in the excess growth, for example, excess growth in GDP, or if it's linked to a commodity, you know, if, you know, if the program is built on assumptions of a certain price trajectory for the price of oil or some other commodity, and that price is exceeded, then uh, again, the investors can share in some of the upside, which was you know not anticipated um, in the in the in the underlying program. Now the truth is that this is you know a very good idea in practice, but um, for most investors in the market, um, there is a real question about how much value these instruments provide. They don't trade very well in the market because they're not included in emerging bar market bond indices. Uh, they uh, are tend to be illiquid and fixed income investors don't typically like to hold them in their portfolios. So they are again sort of a an, an additive element that has helped uh, bridge the difference the, and sort of get get a deal done in sovereign debt restructuring. But uh, pure value recovery instruments uh, you know have not been seen and probably are not currently seen as the solution to all the problems in the sovereign debt restructuring. Um, and I'll just make one, uh, I'll, I'll just say a couple of words about SCDIs. State contingent debt instruments is maybe a broader category than value recovery instruments. Uh, it encompasses really any instrument that could be a pure fixed income instrument that has a component that is linked to some contingency in the future. So there is a there is a very much a, a debate now uh, in sovereign debt restructuring circles and, and more widely, and including within the IMF, which has 
I think published a paper on this uh, a few years ago, that state contingent debt instruments uh, could provide a way to bridge some of the uh, differences in expectation about the future trajectory of, uh, of, of growth or other metrics in a, in a uh, sovereign debtors uh, economy. And what I mean by that is that uh, you could, for example, in a state contingent debt instrument, imagine including a provision which uh, automatically reduces the, the payout of interest or extends the, the amortization schedule uh, on debt payments if growth has not hit a certain level uh, over a defined period of time or if FX reserves haven't accumulated to a certain level or if some other objective criteria have not been met. So that, you know, without the, the requirement of a further restructuring, you have automatic stabilizers built into the terms of, of the instruments. Um, it's quite an interesting concept. Um, and, you know, arguably, if, if you built these types of provisions into a a fixed income instrument that is delivered in the context of a sovereign debt restructuring, and you replace the whole debt stock of a country, a commercial debt stock with instruments that contain this feature, uh, then there might be some scope to you know, provide, uh, to, to base the terms of that instrument on a slightly more optimistic scenario than sort of the worst case scenarios that are often used uh, in IMF methodologies to suggest what is, you know, a sustainable debt load, because you'll always have these automatic stabilizers that will uh, kick in if adverse scenarios unfold. Um, in, in my judgment, there's uh, certainly scope to be considering the use of these instruments, not only in Sri Lanka, but in, in, other, uh, in other sovereigns uh, restructuring scenarios that are unfolding in the world right now. And I think we're going to see more and more debate about the use of SCDIs in different forms, you know, over the coming uh, weeks and months. Um, Manjuka, I think I'll, I'll stop at that because I know we're short, running short on time, but happy to, you know, go into more detail on elements of, of those topics uh, at a later time. Yes, thank you very much, Ian. I, I always appreciate it. Never, you have always uh, astound me the exactly knowledge of uh, 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 of sovereign debt, so you never. There's never a the moment you cannot give an answer to me. I, I, I always. So Sean, Sean, uh, uh, um, uh, I have the pleasure of inviting you to make a presentation. You, I know you, you will be speaking on the IMF their policy as to really sharing the sharing the DSA and whose document it is and whether the early visibility helps in bringing about resolutions. And I also invite you to comment on. Uh, Reza's and Sergey and Ian's uh, presentations. Thank you. Over to you, Sergey. So, what is Sergey Sean? Sean, please. Uh, thank you, Manjuka. Thank you for the uh, Bar Association's invitation to me. Uh, and um, I know time is short. And one of the advantages of being uh, the last speaker is I basically can be brief. And I want to really just um, emphasize a few points that have already been made by the excellent remarks of my colleagues. Um, and I, I really have four points. Um, the first one, and it picks up on Reza's discussion of the role of the DSA, which I completely agree with. Um, and it's as follows, is as Reza has indicated, the DSA, the debt sustainability analysis of the fund, is central to its own decision as to whether or not to lend. And I think we have to view it as a public good. And what I mean by that is that when the IMF determines that debt is unsustainable, what it means is that there's no amount of lending that the IMF can provide and no amount of adjustment that the country can undertake that can enable the country to repay its debt unless that debt is restructured. So in the absence of a debt restructuring, in those circumstances, when that finding is made, basically, you're, it's not a question of if there's gonna be a debt restructuring, it's a question of when. 
and delays and further financing by the fund without a debt restructuring not only hurts the country, but it also hurts the creditors. Why? Because essentially IMF debt will just replace debt that is falling due and the IMF is a senior creditor and the remaining creditors will be subordinated. So when debt is unsustainable, it is in everyone's interest for the debt to be restructured as quickly and as an orderly fashion as possible. That's the first point. So it's a crucial determination and it's, it's a determination made by the fund and is part of the fund's mandate and is really a key public good that the fund basically provides. The second point I would make is the point made by Ian about the program. If the bad news is that the debt is unsustainable, the good news is, is that the IMF has agreed with the country on an adjustment path that will make the debt sustainable. And that is also a public good. It's important for the country so that it can basically take the necessary steps amongst other things to return to medium term viability and to restore market access. But it's also key to the creditors because the creditors having been told that they have to basically provide debt relief, now one up some degree of assurance that the policies that are being undertaken by the country are actually going to be adequate to basically enable them to repay the restructured debt. Uh, and also that the countries are actually going to um, implement those policies. Policies. So that is a second dimension of the public good that arises, which I think is critical. Um, so it very much is Manjuka a, 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 an analysis by the fund. And because it's central to its own determination, and it is a public good that, they, that everybody expects the fund to provide, it's not something that can be delegated to a third party, and it's not something really that can be negotiated with creditors. Uh, Reza and uh, Ian have indicated, you know, at what point it is published. The, the one thing I would add uh, is, you know, inevitably there are differences between the IMF and uh, creditors on the DSA assumptions, and that, hap that, that, that is often the case. When I was working at the fund, there were differences of use. And I think that Ian has identified a very interesting uh, issue that I know many people are looking at is the concept of state contingent debt instruments have been discussed generally, but I think there is an interest in looking at them, Manjuka, specifically in the context of bridging differences between the creditor community on the one hand and the IMF on the other on basically the macroeconomic assumptions that underpin the DSA. To what extent there are differences, perhaps the fund is perceived as being excessively pessimistic from creditors' perspectives. To what extent can SEDIs be designed to basically bridge that difference and the devil is in the details. What trigger to you do you use? Um, but I do think that that is an area where uh, there is scope for future work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron, for the insightful presenta presentation. Just a few uh, second round. It's just a short round. We just want to just to uh, just to figure, finish off things and make complete for completion sake. Ian, uh, would you care to explain to us what is what is meant by the consent solicitation exit and ex ex exit consent and what role does uh, collective action clauses play in debt restructuring? There are lawyers on the bar association, there are junior lawyers especially who will be interested in knowing about that from the legal legal perspective, what does it mean? Yeah, thanks, Mandrew Um Yeah, so I mean, the, the, when we're talking about consent solicitations, exit consents, collective action clauses. What we're talking about is um, sort of the, the, the architecture 
uh, that is applied to implement a sovereign debt restructuring where the terms have been agreed within the context of you know the the DSA analysis and the other the other considerations that we've been discussing on this call. So this is we're now moving into how do we implement the restructuring and how can we do it in a way that is efficient and avoids the risk uh, that rogue actors might disrupt the process. So maybe just to sort of step back a moment, um, you know, what is a consent solicitation? A consent solicitation is the process for amending the terms of a, of a tradable debt instrument at, it, at its simplest. Um, in, in a sovereign debt restructuring, consent solicitations are often used alongside what we call exchange offers to effectuate the terms of the restructuring. An exchange offer, again, is it's a voluntary process where uh, the issuer, the sovereign debtor, invites the bondholders to tender their existing holdings of ISBs uh, for uh, the consideration to be offered in, in the restructuring. And that may comprise um, new fixed income instruments, uh, value recovery instruments, as we've discussed, uh, some, some cash component. Uh, this is the, the core of the exchange, which replaces the existing debt stock with, with new debt, which uh, by IMF metrics will you know, fall within the category of being sustainable, potentially to high probability. So the implementation of, of this is very important. If, if you make an offer of instruments that achieve that, that would achieve your objective, um, but you don't get sufficiently high participation in that exchange offer, then you're not going to achieve the objectives of the restructuring because you're going to leave behind contractually binding legacy debt with the old commercial terms, which is plainly uh, the source of the sustainability problem that's trying to be addressed. And on the flip side, you know, if you have significant numbers of holdouts, the, the creditors in question, the bondholders who have been asked to exchange their positions for something far less valuable, will be very concerned at the inequitable treatment that they are receiving compared to those that are holding out. So for both of those reasons, it's critically important in a sovereign debt restructuring to have high participation. And this is, um, this is really where the consent solicitation and the collective action clauses come into their own. Because what we have seen in, in many of the, 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 the recent uh, sovereign debt restructurings is an exchange offer being used where a restructuring package is offered to to bondholders reflecting the terms that have been negotiated successfully, we will assume, between the bondholder committee uh, and the sovereign. And they, it, it's consistent with the terms of the DSA. So this is offered in an exchange offer, but a, a variety of carrots and sticks is included in the, uh, in the structure of that offering to incentivize participation. So, uh, for example, the exchange offer is linked with a consent solicitation for, that relates to the legacy instruments. Um, so that, uh, you know, for example, if, uh, if the requisite supermajority of bondholders accept the terms of the new instrument, of the new sort of the new package that is being offered, then at the same time, they are uh, agreeing to amend the terms of the old instruments to, uh, to impose you know, harsh conditions on those holders who have not participated in the exchange offer. And this is made possible by the use of what we call the collective action clauses. Now, in, in, uh, in sovereign debt instruments from 20, 30 years ago, uh, there were many bonds that were issued uh, 
that had no uh, provision for collective action, which is to say 100% of holders of that instrument would need to agree to an amendment to core financial terms. That obviously gave huge amounts of leverage to, to investors who wish to hold out because they could effectively disrupt the whole process of restructuring. Um, starting about 20 years ago, we saw collective action clauses coming into sovereign bonds, which allowed super majorities of, let's say, 75% to amend the terms of bonds. And more recently, in 2014, uh, under the leadership of the ICMA and with the support of the IMF and the G7, um, we saw what we call aggregation collective action clauses being introduced into sovereign bonds, which take that supermajority concept one step further and provide a mechanism to ensure that uh, that all of that if there is voting on a restructuring by a, an aggregate, uh, you know, a, a, a whole series of bonds, you know, let's say all of the series of bonds that are outstanding, that as long as you hit certain numerical thresholds on an aggregated basis, you can enforce uh, the, the uh, you know, the product of that voting on the minority uh, right across all of the different series. These modern aggregated collective action clauses uh, and I won't go into the details of how they work because they're they're quite complicated, but have been really quite successful in discouraging holdout behavior in sovereign debt restructuring. So that what we find is that when a creditor committee uh, reaches agreement with the debtor and an offer is launched into the market with under an exchange offer structure with these consent solicitations built in. Uh, that I've been describing, this is, you know, most often uh, been successful because potential holdout creditors uh, worry and are very attuned to the risk that they could be left behind, the deal could be approved, and they could be forced against their will to take, you know, a far less attractive deal than they would get if they had signed up to the exchange in the first place. So, um, in in short. I think what we, when we talk about the topic of consent solicitation and exit consents, and exit consent is simply the term of art for uh, participants in the exchange offer providing their consent as they are leaving their old instruments and getting new ones, but providing their consent to adverse changes to the legacy instruments. You know, using these tools in combination with one another have proven very powerful and some would say almost coercive to the market to ensure the success of sovereign debt restructurings. And once a deal is struck between um, a creditor committee and a debtor, it, what's interesting is that you find really an, an identity of interest between them to try to use these techniques to get the deal over the line. Because the last thing that the bondholders wish who are participating in a bondholder holder committee, for example, is to see uh, substantial numbers of holdouts disrupting the uh, the restructuring process uh, Thank and, you. And, and, and sort of keeping things from moving forward. So Thank I'll, you, I'll leave it at that, Manjuka. Yeah. yeah, Thank you, Yad. Uh, just so quickly to finish off with the, uh, from our questions, uh, Sean, who is at who are probably the author of these policies also, they quickly explain to us what do you mean by the lending into arrears policy, lending into official arrears policy, and non-tolerance policy of the IMF. And can you explain to the viewers here, because we get this often bandied about in our, in our media, what do you mean by credible and specific insurance in context of the lending into arrears policy and good, and good faith in terms of the lending into, lending into arrears policy and the, and what does should there be consultation with the IMF and commercial creditors in determining whether good faith threshold has been uh, has been has been satisfied? Thank you. So yes, Manjur, I'll be again. I um, be brief because I think we're we're running out of time. So um, I know there is a bit of an alphabet soup here of policies: uh, LIA, LOIA. So 
just let me start with the broadest concept. So assuming that a country has reached a program with the IMF, even if there's no debt restructuring, often the adjustment by the country and the financing provided by the fund does not fill the hole in the balance of payments that needs to be filled. You need to have contributions by third parties, financing contributions by third party. And the IMF can't go forward unless the program is viable and fully financed. So therefore the fund cannot go forward with the program unless it receives assurances from these third parties that they're gonna provide the financing. Hence, the financing assurances policy. Now, in the context of a country that has unsustainable debt and where the fund recognizes that there needs to be a debt restructure, there, the financing assurances are assurances by creditors that they're going to basically provide the debt relief or concessional financing. It can also be concessional financing that allows this gap to be filled in the program assumptions, right? That allows the program to be viable. The program that basically is designed to ensure debt sustainability. So in the context of debt restructuring, that's the type of financing insurances looked at. Now, this is tricky in a debt restructuring because for a variety of reasons, and it used to be, Manjuka, that back in the 80s, the fund would not go forward until creditors had, private creditors, in this case, commercial banks in the 80s, had agreed to the terms of a re debt restructuring that were consistent with the program. The problem was, as you can imagine, private creditors often delayed reaching agreement for a variety of reasons. And this created a problem for the fund. The problem was, is on the one hand, they wanted to support the country. There, were, there was a political window for reform in those countries and they wanted to do it immediately, but they had a financing assurances problem because they hadn't got the creditor commitment. So the fund came up with a new policy, a very powerful policy that allowed it to go forward even though they had not received assurances from the creditors. And what is that policy? It is the lending into arrears policy. And effectively what the lending into arrears policy does is provide financing assurances in a kind of non-consensual way. And it works like this. The IMF assumes when it approves the program that even though there's not an agreement now with creditors, that there will be one and that that agreement will be consistent with the program assumptions. And if there isn't an agreement, that in those cases, the program will not uh, have financing that will enable the creditors to get repaid, and the IMF will tolerate the arrears to those creditors. In other words, and actually the arrears provide the financing for that program. Now, the fund is not encouraging a country to default. On the contrary, the, the IMF wants a consensual agreement, but the fund is willing to tolerate arrears if they arise. Now, what's really important, and this is relevant now to a lot of the debt restructurings, is that in the old days, Manjuka, the problem was with the private creditors and the LIA was targeted at private creditors. Official creditors generally agreed very quickly, and they were Paris Club creditors. Increasingly now, because of the change in the composition of official bilateral creditors, getting agreement, the intercreditor equity coordination problem, this problem has spread to the official creditors. And some would say the biggest problem now especially now that we have collective action clauses that deal with private creditors, the biggest problem is with the official bilateral creditors because of the change in the composition of these creditors. So the IMF had, had to introduce a new policy, which allowed it to lend into the arrears of official creditors as a way of getting financing assurances where there were delays. And the challenge right now is the extent to which the fund can actually apply that policy. In an environment where some creditors like China have enormous leverage over the process. And this is one of the issues that is playing out now. I don't wanna prejudge it. I don't wanna get into the details of Sri Lanka, but I think that this is a critical issue that um, the, the IMF and the international community 
are trying to address. Thank you very much, uh, Sean. Uh, just there are, a few, there are a few audience questions. I probably can take about three. So I, I, there's one I probably, Sergey is first disqualified to answer it, just to take it. There's a question from, uh, from the audience as to whether, whether the assurance or what, what's publicly known about China's commitment to debt restructure would amount to financial assurance that would add, satisfy the IMF. Do you, what do you think? You, can you, I, I think I'm, uh, Sergey probably can take a stab at that if I like, invite him to do so. Um, yeah, so um, what I know is uh, what the news said a few days ago, sometime last week, where it sounded like Exim Bank of China was offering a two-year extension or something like that, which doesn't sound like a very generous thing, right? Uh, I don't know what the rest uh, of China claims are looking like at the moment, but I suspect that if all that is on the table are extensions and they are just a few years, I think this will cause friction with other creditors and especially with other official creditors on the G7 side. So I think it remains, it remains really, really uncertain. And I think Zambia, unfortunately, is making everyone very cautious on that front. So there's a bit of a negative spillover to Sri Lanka, which makes many of my clients wonder, well, is this going to be another Zambia situation where it takes forever to get all major creditors to agree on, on something that can go forward, right? Thank, thank you, Ian. Thank you, sir. There is uh, another question. I think Ian probably and Sean can I answer that. Uh, in Argentina, there was the there was before uh, before the before the fund approved it. There was an early publication of the DSA. Uh, do you think that can is do is that what what is your opinion of that? When the, is, does that is that a good president or a bad president? That's a question. The audience, uh, so Sean or yet probably to probably could I, if you could answer it. Hello. Ian, you want to yeah, take it? Yeah. yeah. No. I, why don't you go ahead, Sean? <laughs> I just want to say that I think I completely agree with Ian on this, which is that I think that the 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 difficulty with the Argentine situation was that the DSA was released and essentially was not underpinned by an IMF supported program. This is the point that made, and I think this is the, the was is the complexity, and I think, quite frankly, the the shortcoming of that process. So I would just sort of support what Ian said in that context. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, then there is another question from the from the audience as to the importance of designing uh, designing uh, debt deals that unlock uh, uh, growth. Uh, Reza, would you like to uh, would you like to elaborate on it, or would you be able to? Explain, would you be able to in, anything which you would add to it? Is it a... sure, Manjuka? So, um, uh, and I'm glad uh, you know to hear this question because I and together with Danny Roderick and Isaac Gowan have, in fact, recently ris uh, written um, on this issue as well. And there's a summary in Project Syndicate. And um, the point, in a very, very um, brief manner, is that. A lot of the discourse in uh, sovereign debt restructuring gets concentrated on the financial terms, the very, very narrow uh, domain of uh, what are some of the indicators that have been defined, <clears throat> for instance, whether it's on debt to GDP, whether it's on the gross financing needs, or uh, the uh, related indicators. And what we, the point we make in this piece is that what gets left out is a more dedicated discussion on what structural policies need to be implemented or need to be part of the program that would generate a much higher growth trajectory for the data. And it is, in fact, the potential of those growth enhancing structural reforms 
that enlarge the size of the pie that is available for all types of predators. So it is um, the point that I would just like to make is that particularly for institutions like the World Bank, um, which arguably is, um, you know, more it has in its mandate to focus on structural reforms, that there is a role to be played to assess the debt restructuring agreement or the policy package, not just in terms of the macro targets, but also putting in place difficult structural reforms that may have been avoided for years because they're politically costly as part of the adjustment policies. You know, there's adjustment and there is financing. And I often find that in a lot of debt restructuring, it becomes all about macro and less of a focus on what can be some of the structural reforms that can unlock growth and particularly that type of growth which generates more foreign currency earnings in the future. A question, I think, from a very distinguished member of the audience. Uh, I think it should be answered is a question that I think she, uh, she raises in a podcast. Could you, could you touch upon a sequencing of negotiations with bilateral creditors and private creditors? And can, can creditor committee go first under a current circumstance do, or do you have to wait for China's China and others? It's an interesting moot point. I've sort of, I think it's a, it, it is by itself a paper to be written on. So I would invite uh, who I... Ian, would you uh, would Sean perhaps uh, take a, take a first step at it? I'll, I'll I'll wait until Ian comments and then I'll take. I'm happy to take a step at it. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'll, 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 I saw I'll the start. name, so I just wanted to. I, I said okay. justice. She stayed two two hours. Listen to this, so we must uh, at least pay. It's just fine. Um, th thanks, Manjuka. I, no, it's a it's a it's a great question, and the. Uh, the truth is that you know sovereign debt restructuring is a dance without a established choreography. Um, we're all in in a sense feeling our way along here, and you have a, a variety of stakeholders who are very interested in the outcome. And you have the official creditors, you have the IMF, you have the obviously the domestic uh, creditors, you have the sovereign itself. Um, Bondholders, everyone is is uh, looking at this. They want to have their voice in the process, but they also want to find a solution that works for everybody. Because without consensus, you know, all what you have is a failed process. You have delay, and we've seen the consequences of that in other restructuring processes around the world. Uh, it's it's to be avoided uh, if we can. So, uh, in terms of sequencing, I think you know it's pretty clear. To me, and certainly, it, it, it I think uh, for for private bondholders would say that uh, doing you know doing a restructuring in a linear way where uh, you know for you know the, the uh, agreement is reached with the uh, official sector creditors on financing assurances, and there's no real engagement with the private sector until. You have a program that has been approved and published, and then sort of the private sector has to accept the consequences of that uh, and you know, sort of work within that framework. I, I honestly think that that is a recipe for, uh, for creating potent, potential delay uh, and difficulties in implementing the restructuring. You know, once, once the IMF board approves a program, it's next to impossible to change it. Uh, and if uh, a program is approved under a DSA uh, where with certain targets and, and with certain parameters, which is, is simply not going to work for one constituency or another, uh, you know, that doesn't serve anyone's purpose. And if there can be some degree of parallelism in, in the communications and the negotiations, uh, which I think is what is happening right now, um, I think that is much more advantageous than trying to do it in too linear a way. But as I said, there's no there's no set choreography for this. And you know, I think everyone is is feeling their way along to make sure that their interests are properly uh, 
heard and expressed, and we can get a deal done as quickly as, as can be. Thank you. Sean? Yeah, so just picking up on that, I mean, the sequence typically is, you know, official first and private later. But in an environment where essentially it's been difficult for um, the fund in the country to get assurances from official creditors, and private creditors are concerned about the cost of delay as the country is, um, one can not rule out the possibility that basically uh, a deal would be done um, with uh, private creditors first. Now, private creditors would want, and this is the point that Reza has and Ian has indicated, that there be some understanding between the fund and the policies, because as you know, that's that's the path out of the distress that would need to be in place. But one could imagine, for example, that to the extent to which the IMF applies its lending into official arrears policy, because an agreement has not yet been reached by the official creditors, that the private creditors on that on the basis of an approval of a program would go forward with the debt restructuring. So it, it doesn't have to be the sequence that is typically followed, which is official first. Reza? Thank you, Manjuka. I wanted to just make two comments, and these are going to be seemingly contradictory, but it's important um, to get them out on the role of the private creditors. And the first point that I want to make is the argument for early engagement with private creditors, the argument for efforts towards burden sharing, is not only important from a perspective of good faith and intercreditor equity and burden sharing, but it is also critically important from the perspective that for the official sector, ultimately the official sector is only going to be repaid by re-establishment of market access and provision of capital from the private sector. At least for the IMF, which in, by its mandate is not in the long-term lending business, do not remain engaged for long-term with you know, specific members, it only gets repaid when a country is able to successfully borrow from the private sector. So that to me is the ultimate reason why it is important to have an approach that all stakeholders have ownership in. But let me make the other point. We often think that the private sector is just one entity. And it is important to realize that the private sector is very much divided between the current bondholders and the potential new bondholders. And once a country has decided that it has taken the reputational loss of seeking debt relief from private creditors, the greater the relief provided by all creditors, private as well as official, the more attractive are the bonds, the new bonds going to be to new creditors. And often for a finance minister or a central bank governor, the metric of success of a debt restructuring becomes how much the newly issued bonds rally in the region. <clears throat> after the debt restructuring. And there is a paradox because the deeper the haircut on the existing private creditors, the more attractive are the new instruments to potential new private creditors. Just, uh, just uh, yeah, and no, I mean, as a question from the audience, I, do you think uh, the governance related commitments that the government has to give to the IMF in its program, which it now, features, and I saw it is in Ukraine also, it was there. Uh, does that uh, play any part in sort of uh, in the in the bond to, in the private creditors considerations of signing up to the tree structure? That's a question that I mean put across. And I thought I'll put that to you. Thank you. Sorry, who is that question to Majuka? No, to Ian. I, I wanted to just sort of, first of all, just quickly address sort of Reza's comment, which which I agree with. I think what's really, but what's really important to remember 
And this is a change maybe in, in the complexion of sovereign debt restructuring that is quite significant, is that the, the big real money investors who you know, buy sovereign debt in the primary market are now the ones who are sitting on the committees that are negotiating the debt restructurings. This is, it's no longer the case that when bonds are trading at highly distressed levels, they're dumped in the market and, and bought up by hedge funds and, and uh, investors that have maybe a slightly different and shorter term time horizon than you know, the, 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 the huge multi-trillion dollar money managers of, of Wall Street. But now we're seeing those same investors staying with the sovereign through the credit cycle. So to Reza's point, um, you know, the bondholders who are sitting on the committee, the Black Rocks and Fidelities and, and other huge institutions who are participating in the process are the same ones who are going to be buying those, those bonds of, uh, of the sovereign in the future. And that, that's why it really isn't, in, in my view, a zero-sum game here. It's a, it's a question of solving a problem uh, in a constructive way so that uh, the sovereign can regain access to the market and resume that long-term cooperation with with those investors. I think that's the um, I think that's has to be the the principal goal of of this process, not to inflict pain on the creditors, but to find a solution that works, and then uh, regain market access, which, as Reza said, I think is critical to. Uh, achieve the growth targets that are ultimately the the solution to a debt a debt problem uh, and debt sustainability problem. Mandrew could just remind me of the uh, the other. Yeah, the question. question was was on the governance related reforms where government where the IMF tends to now say this, and I know you worked on you worked on you worked on. Uh, Ukraine, where there was a lot of governments, govern, governance related reform, does, yes. the, does does that play play important role in important role in uh, the gov in the consideration of the private creditors in the commitments that government gives about the re governance related reform? That there's a question from the audience. Yeah, no, I think it's, I'm I'm longstanding counsel to Ukraine, and we've had, uh, and I think one of the real benefits to the programs that that Ukraine and other sovereigns have had with the fund over the years is that it provides a, um, you know, to some degree, some political cover for politicians who may be uh, worried about making reforms to governance, anti-corruption reforms, anti-money laundering reforms. Uh, it, it can touch on very sensitive subjects with local elites. And if, if these reforms are made a condition of programs with the IMF and, and lending with international financial institutions, uh, this can really be a win-win because the government can, uh, can put, push through very important reforms that may be difficult politically to do without that external pressure. And without a doubt, the, the benefit comes from you know, better uh, sort of better perceptions from investors uh, you know, in probably a perception of improved growth prospects and greater likelihood of being repaid, which translates into lower yields. So, uh, you know, I think without a doubt, that aspect of the focus of the IMF and other international financial institutions is overall healthy and, and, and viewed positively by the investor community. Thank you very much, uh... Of everybody, thank you, Ian. I mean, I, I I still can't thank you enough for encouraging me over the last two years and been 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 help just been uh, tolerating my all sorts of questions I put to you. And uh, if not, you taught me a lot. So I will hand over the proceedings to my colleague, Andrew, Ms. Andrew the Ferreira, to do the sort of in the proceedings. Thank you. Thank we have a distinguished audience. Also, thank you for uh, being joining us. And uh, Andrew, the I'm I'm on. I'm on. So uh, that brings uh, today's uh, webinar to conclusion. And um, I take great pleasure in uh, delivering this vote of thanks on behalf of the Overseas Relations Committee and the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. Um, I would first like to 
thank our speakers today who are globally recognized leading professionals in their respective spheres. Uh, the presentations were of the highest order and it was remarkable to see how they packed their scholarly analysis of the topic into the short span of time uh, that was allocated to each of them and how clearly the, the, they presented to maximize the understanding within our audience. Um, we had a great audience today at one time, at one time I think it peaked over 190, close to 200. Um, we had participants from Americas to Africa, Europe, Middle East to Asia. Um, so in that context, I would like to thank Dr. Sergey Lanao, uh, Deputy Chief Economist at the International Institute of Finance, um, Emerging Market Division of the IMF, and the International Finance Division of the Bank of England. Um, Mr. Sean Hagen, um, Senior Advisor at Rothschild and Co, and Professor in Practice at University of Georgetown Law School. And um, Dr. Reza Bakhi, the former Governor of State Bank of Pakistan, Senior Fellow, Harvard Kennedy School, um, Division Chief, Sovereign Debt Division, IMF, and Mr. Ian Clark, Head of the Sovereign and Public Sector Practice at White and Case NLP London. Dear sirs, thank you most profoundly for taking time today from your busy schedules to speak at this webinar and share your expertise with the participants. Then um, every webinar, every successful event, great event, has a great team behind that. And I would like to thank the team that uh, put together this wonderful and topical uh, seminar, uh, webinar. And first of all, I would like to thank Mr. Manjuka Fernando Pule, who was the moderator today. He's our dynamic convener um, of the OC's Relations Committee. Um, he worked tirelessly and coordinated a lot of the work. Um, and a lot of credit should go to uh, Mr. Fernando Pule for putting this event together. I would then like to thank Dr. Asanka Gunawansa, the chairman of the Overseas Relations uh, Committee, for his unreserved support and empowering guidance uh, that enables us time and time again to deliver uh, topical uh, webinars that have been gathering a high, uh, high international following. Um, our assistants, Ms. Shannon Pereira, Ms. Neshika De Silva, led by Ms. Kavita Sivasubramaniam, who have contributed heavily behind the scenes, um, supporting Manjuka and uh, others in the committee to make this webinar happen. Uh, Ms. Dushanti Adhikari and the other committee members of the ORC, and a special thanks to Mr. Salia Piris, President's Council, the President of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, and Mr. Isru Bala Patabendi, the Secretary, and the EXCO members who have been most supportive throughout all our work. So with that, I would like to thank you, thank everyone, thank all the participants, the speakers and the members for being here today. Thank you very much. And please look forward to our next webinar and participate um, as much as you can. Thank you, a wonderful evening. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. <laughs>